Hello everyone, welcome to the Voice of Nursing. My name is Adrian Tracy, uh, the CEO of ICG. Uh, very, very lucky today to be joined by Dr. Sachin Jain. Dr. Sachin, welcome. Thank you so much, great to be here. Sachin, tell us a little bit about yourself and a bit about your background in the healthcare industry. Yeah, I'm a, a physician uh, by training internal medicine. Uh, uh, I was um, an undergraduate uh, as well as a medical student business student and resident um, at Harvard and um, spent a couple of years in the uh, uh, Obama administration where I worked on implementing healthcare reform as well as um, uh, worked on the implementation of the High Tech Act, which is the federal legislation here uh, that's focused on getting electronic health records to doctors. And then um, uh, spent uh, several years as a physician at the VA, uh, which is the veteran system here in uh, the US. Uh, and uh, am now uh, uh, CEO of CareMore, which is a, a big delivery system here that's focused on the care of high cost, high need patients. Um, we employ over 800 clinical staff. We have about 2000 employees in total. Um, we're in 10 states across the United States, growing 12 next year. So uh, it's an exciting place to be. Sounds, sounds pretty busy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you, you know, make that different role from moving from that medical area into then, you know, the CEO type role? You know, it's quite a Different. Yeah, so I actually came to CareMore originally as chief medical officer. So I was leading the uh, uh, you know clinical arm of the company, and uh, and then um, as part of a planned succession, ended up um, uh, replacing Leba Lesson as CEO uh, when she retired from here uh, in uh, early 2016. Fantastic. And the, um, I know one of the things we talked about or looked into your background that you worked with the Obama administration. I did. How was that? It was an incredible experience. I mean, um, I made some of the best friends that I've ever made uh, in my life. Uh, it was a short period of my life. It was a little bit less than two years. Um, but when you're, you know, kind of in an intense experience like that, um, you see things uh, that you'll never get a chance to see anywhere else. You meet people that you'll never get a chance to meet uh, anywhere else. And I think, you know, the most exciting thing about being in a federal policy making role was, um, you know, kind of realizing how broad and diverse uh, the country is. You, you meet with so many different stakeholder groups uh, and, you know, you realize that you know, everyone is largely concerned about the same thing, which is their place in the future. And so um, I think a lot of why we struggle with, you know, changes uh, is that I think we all are worried about ourselves and um, it's kind of the most human thing uh, that we that we experience. Um, but it also ends up being one of the biggest barriers that we have to actually creating change in, in an ecosystem that needs to change. And so um, I think, you know, you learn a lot of empathy, um, but then you also kind of learn you have to be able to make hard decisions to really drive things forward. Yeah, I suppose that the Medicaid and Medicare, we, we hear a lot about and obviously some challenges. Exactly. Yeah. So Medicare, so Medicare is a federal program in the U.S. that um, uh, manages the care of patients who are over the age of 65 or um, suffer from some form of disability. Um, and uh, what it is is a payment system that allows us to pay private providers um, to actually take care of um, you know our patients. Uh, and then um, there is also a Medicaid program which is focused on um, people who it's a federally funded state administered program um, that actually focuses on um, people who are of, of low income or uh, of uh, Kind of, kind of poor financial uh, or economic means. And so um, that's an important program as well. Um, the two of them, you know, combined to pay for more than 50% of the healthcare that's actually delivered in the United States. Um, so even though we don't have an NHS like you do, um, we do have a federal payment infrastructure that does pay for a lot of the healthcare that's delivered to Americans. Very good. And sort of leads us nicely on, I know you speak quite a bit about uh, the social detriments and how that, that matters within health. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges we have is that I think we've tr traditionally, our, our healthcare system in the U.S. really grew out of the acute care system. It grew out of hospitals and paying for, um, you know, severe illness when patients landed themselves in the hospital um, really came out of uh, the insurance system that arose after World War II in this country. Um, what, you know, I think has really happened in the last uh, 60 or 70 years is that the burden of illness has really shifted from acute illness to chronic illness. As people live longer, um, they suffer with chronic diseases. There's been a lot of changes in lifestyle in the country. And so, you know, people have cardiovascular disease, COPD, diabetes, 
Um, and that really requires a different approach that's more holistic in nature, that really looks at the whole person in the context of their whole life. Um, and that's particularly an issue in the senior population where, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, we don't think about the fact that you can have the best doctors in the world, the best clinical programs in the world, but if you don't have transportation to come to and from the medical appointment, um, you're not necessarily able to get there. Or, you know, you can prescribe the best medicines um, to a patient, but if they don't have food at home um, or they don't live in secure housing, um, you're not necessarily able to really, you know, live your best life and, and achieve your best health. And so I think there's been a big sea change in the dialogue in the U.S. that I think has been largely positive. Um, that's really focused on thinking about patients in um, the broader context. I think, you know, Caremore's contribution to that, our, my personal contribution to that, I think over the last couple of years has been trying to inject um, a lot of dialogue around the notion of loneliness and the fact that, you know, social isolation is a huge healthcare risk factor. I know that that's something that, you know, the UK government has also focused on appointing a um, minister of loneliness. Um, I would argue that the branding needs to change a little bit. We, we, at, we at Caremore have appointed a chief togetherness officer. I think togetherness is a bit more positive yeah, definitely. Than, than, uh, than loneliness. Um, so, you know, if you wouldn't mind uh, just letting your, your, you know, government, uh, your prime minister know that. Yeah, should... Theresa May is pretty busy at the moment, but, uh, please, please you know, let, I'm, I'm sure I can have a chat to her while she's got some time off from Brexit, but I'm sure I can please, have a chat to her. Please let prime minister May know that, um, that I'm recommending a rebranding. That would be, okay. that would, if you could take care of that for me, that would be great. So. Yeah, I remember. Well, Dr. Ram Raji's been on on this as well, who I know you you know you know very well, and uh, and he he talked about those the wellness factors. But he said about being near a near a supermarket to get good vegetables. He said, yeah, no, one of those, those factors that you're talking about?" Dr. Raji's done some really great work, um, both you know in the New York Health and Hospitals Corporation as well as um, the North Shore system uh, that uh, is all over the New York you know tri-state area. Um, but you know, I, I just think we need to start thinking about people in the context of their whole life, uh, and, and as opposed to and their communities, as opposed to thinking about them, you know, purely from the perspective of, you know, here's a medical problem and here's a treatment. There's so many other things that play into whether or not a patient is going to be able to get better. And, I, and the truth is, is that you know anybody who's practiced medicine or seen medicine in, in a in a developing world context knows that. Um, and we just kind of ignore that, I think, in developed countries because we, we kind of live with this mental model that most people are like us. Um, and so most of the people who are in leadership positions or positions of influence in healthcare live largely divorced from the realities that I think many of our patients face. Um, I had this very interesting experience here at Caremore um, where we had you know 250 um, mem of our patients come to a town hall meeting and I asked the question, this was about a year and a half ago, how many of you have heard of Lyft or Uber, um, which are, you know, I, I'm not sure about the penetration in the UK, but I, I imagine- Uber, Uber are massive. This very, yeah. you know, so, so this is something that, you know, almost any American, you know, uh, my age in this country, you know, knows they use on a daily basis, but in a population of seniors who are, you know, on a Medicare Advantage plan like Caremore, um, you know, almost, no hands went up in the audience. Two hands went up, and uh, you know when I asked about Lyft or Uber, really? and so that you know, and those were two patients who had actually participated in our pilot with Lyft um, around kind of supporting transportation for for our members, and so I just think that there's this huge gap between the people we serve and the people who are in leadership and influence in in the healthcare industry, and that gap I think ignores the fact that you know many of our patients don't have access to the kinds of things that they need to actually get better and live their best lives and so um, that's been a huge area of focus for us no, really interesting and um obviously moving on we're, we are a nursing channel uh, yes. so it'd be you know really good to hear about you know how how's nursing looking at the moment and you know what the biggest challenge I think, is there? I think nursing is in a moment of real um I, I wouldn't say crisis but i would say it's at a it, it, it's a moment of tension i think um where i think there's been the independent development of the medical profession and then the independent development of the nursing profession and then the subspecialties and advanced you know, practice professions within nursing. And um, I think we need to start thinking way more about how these professional lines collaborate with one another um, as opposed to thinking about their independent and individual development. And a lot of it, I think, starts with how nurses and doctors are trained in, in, a, in the United States. 
um, at really how all healthcare professionals are trained in the United States, which is we're all trained at different schools. We're all learning the same content in often cases, um, but learning them in different schools. And I think that we need to take a different view of health education. Um, you know, I have a ton of respect for pharmacists, for dentists, for nurses, in part because I have close friends um, who, you know, I've traded notes with about, you know, their learning, their education, their professional contribution. But I don't think that that is a broadly, you know, broad experience within the healthcare professions in the United States. And so I think, you know, nursing in particular has a real opportunity to start to think about the bridges that can be, can be built across these professional lines. And, you know, one of the things I worry about is that, you know, there's almost a conflictual nature around these professional lines where there, where there doesn't need to be, um, you know, where nurses in some ways are trained to protect patients from doctors um, or they they view themselves as substituting doctors um, or competing with doctors. And, you know, I think everyone has a role. And the, I think the question is, is how do you craft a system of care in which everyone is able to make their biggest contributions and their best contributions. And I think that's something, you know, we struggle with at CareMore, something that we're working on at CareMore, um, because I think, you know, the key to success in healthcare delivery is making sure everyone's feeling like they can make their biggest and best contribution. Mm -hmm. And I think oftentimes we put people in boxes that they don't belong in. Um, you know, pharmacists is another great example. I think pharmacists, uh, you know, are seen as the folks who put medicines in, pill, in, in in pill boxes, uh, you know, at, at your local pharmacy and, and not much more. Um, and, but, you know, pharmacists are tremendously skilled and gifted people who have a lot to contribute, um, just as nurses are incredibly skilled and gifted people who have a lot to contribute, just as doctors are incredibly skilled and gifted people who have a lot to contribute. But I think we don't have, a, I think, a very deliberate workforce plan in this country around, you know, how do we maximize the, 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 the the, you know that which we can um, from each of these professional areas. I suppose you know from looking at it from a you know a general point of view is that healthcare professionals, nurses, and doctors are under more pressure than they've probably ever been, and they, they, you know they're, they're stretched. And you know one of the big issues is, is is mental health, you know, and burnout. I you know it's so interesting. When I was growing up, they used to talk about the suicide problem among dentists, and um, you know today it's the suicide problem has now kind of migrated to um, physicians. And I think there is a huge burnout problem. I think there is a huge national dialogue that needs to take place on, um, on you know, how do we make these professions uh, livable again for people? Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of factors that are conspiring. I think, um, you know, th there's been kind of a big shift in the United States from independent practice to uh, kind of being, you know, an employee in larger groups. Um, so, you know, there's almost kind of a, you know, uh, Arthur Miller wrote kind of a death of a salesman. Uh, I've thought about, you know, writing death of the solo practitioner in the United States. Um, cause, and, and I think, you know, we talk about loneliness among our patients. Um, but I think there's a lo huge loneliness problem among people who deliver healthcare, um, because mm -hmm. so much of their time is spent looking at the screen. Um, and you know, not, I think most of us, when we, when we decided to go into the healing professions, thought we would spend time with people. And um, I think that's a big part of it. I think the other part of it that get, actually gets very little uh, play in, in the dialogue around these issues is changing consumer expectations. Um, I think our image of you know pa the patient and the doctor is the benevolent physician and then the truly grateful patient. And I think, you know, I think changes in consumerism in our society have made consumers and, and patients more demanding. Um, so there's less gratitude and more expectation. And, um, you know, I think that that is, um, that's, that's challenging for people. That's challenging for people. And I think, you know, on the part of patients, I think it's absolutely appropriate for the standards and the expectations to be higher. Um, but on the flip side, I think it's, I think the professions haven't necessarily adapted to in this, in the way that they can around actually you know, responding to some of those those changes and some of those needs. I think one of the biggest challenges is um, healthcare professionals, doctors and nurses are supposed to be infallible and do everything perfectly at all times, which is just, you know, unrealistic. But, you know, the, the nature of the, you know, the healthcare industry, you know, and any human is mistakes happen. And the more pressure, the more hours people are working, you know, the more mistakes will happen. 
Yeah, and you know, I think people like Don Berwick have really elevated the dialogue on those types of issues, both in the U.S. as well as in the U.K. Um, but you know, to your point, I think there, the infallibility myth is one that persists, um, and I think that one of the things that's exacerbated the infallibility myth is um, the greater transparency around information. Um, you know, it used to be that you had to have a book on your shelf that only, you know, with a very arcane vocabulary that only you know how to read um, when you were a physician. And, you know, I, I remember growing up, my father's a pain management physician and, you know, he was the master of all this knowledge and he was the master of all these books. And um, today, you know, your patients are, are no longer coming in um, with this huge information asymmetry. They've come having done their homework, sat at their computer, Google their information, they're bringing you papers, they're bringing you suggestions, they're asking you about treatments that you may or may not know about. And, um, and so I think that's changed the dynamic in ways that we haven't actually, I think, explicitly addressed as a, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a profession. Um, I think, you know, I don't know that, that medical education, you know, uh, has really adapted to kind of consider that very different view of, of patients. Um, and I think that there's a, there's a segmentation, right? I think one of the big mistakes that's happening is we always, I, I, I get frustrated when people say patients want, um, because, you know, you know, one of the things that people have talked a lot about in the United States is shared decision-making. You know, people want to make their own decisions. Yeah, Patient-centered well, care, I think they call it. Yeah, yeah patient-centered care. But the truth is, is that there's lots of patients who want the doctor to make the decision still. Um, and they want the decisions to be made for them. And so I think that there's a, there's a need for a greater appreciation for the, the segmentation and the fact that we need different delivery models for different types of patients. We need um, digital solutions for patients who want digital solutions. We need bricks and mortar solutions for patients who want to come to facilities. And then we need home-based solutions for patients who are too sick to come to and from. And then we need different types of solutions for patients who are who want to be empowered. Um, and then we need different types of solutions for patients who want maybe more paternalism or more kind of physician driven, you know, management of their care. I, I frequently tell the stories of my parents who have totally different views of, of healthcare. My dad wants to be involved. He wants to know, um, my, my mother really wants the doctor to say, this is what you're going to do. And this is what I want you to do. And he, she actually gets very frustrated when a physician says, well, what would you like? You know, her response is, I'm here because I need you to tell me what I should do. I'm not here to uh, to struggle with you around this decision. And so I think, you know, the psychology of patients, the psychology of being a physician, a clinician, these are all things that we need to spend more time on. Uh, they're, they're, they are fundamental to um, the work we do in building systems of care and in delivering care. As you say, it's going to be a different demographic wants a different type of service, you know, and, you know, different digitally aware, as you say. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was going to, how do you deal with a patient that uh, is turning around and telling you what to, uh, what they want and what they need and coming to you with papers? How do you deal with that as a physician? Well, I think the most you know, important thing is that you, you turn around and go, I've done a few years of, of, uh, of, of training on this. <laughs> that kind of engagement is, you know, is a real gift, right? I mean, you know, you know, one of our biggest challenges and frustrations as physicians is a number of patients who live in total denial of their healthcare problems. And we, we talk about medication non-adherence, um, uh, you know, and the roots of which are real denial around the condition and, you know, the, the vagaries of, of modern life. Um, I, I think when someone comes in and they want to be involved in their care and they have strong ideas, I think you've got to, you know, you've got to engage that. The challenge is when they take it too far. Um, I had a classmate, I, you know, I, I had a classmate from business school whose mother was having some cardiac issues and she called me up and she said, you know, I'm not really sure about this metoprolol drug. Uh, and I, I kind of said to her, I said, you know, you know, in as, as politely and as, and as friendly as I could, I said, you know, stay in your lane. Uh, you know, just, because you know, the name of the drug and just because you read an article doesn't necessarily mean that you have a full understanding of the physiology, the anatomy. And so I, you know, I, th and you know, the pharmacology, um, and I think that we as a society tend to not deal with complexity. We, we kind of have now started to all believe that everything is knowable. Um, when in fact, we all know that that's not true. Um, uh, but sometimes we trick ourselves into believing that, you know, 
uh, a five minute Google search can, can solve problems that really require, you know, the human, human brain um, to, you know, engage, it's kind of engage in a kind of more complex way. Mm. That's always, uh, one other thing we talk about is actually healthcare professionals looking after each other. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, that's where we talk about the burnout and sometimes it's actually the nurse looking after other nurses and asking are they okay, asking if the physician's okay. Because some of the challenges are caregivers are, are there looking after the patient, the patient, the patient. And you hear about physicians, you hear about nurses never getting a break, not being able to go and get something to eat, go to the toilet. You know, they they're working those long shifts. The, the real issue is there, there's actually, a, I think, a declining amount of appreciation, honestly, for people who deliver care. And I think it goes back to this kind of service level stuff. Um, you know, I think we we really underappreciate um, how challenging these jobs are. Um, you know, if you're a nurse, you know, kind of working on a ward, you're administering medications, you're changing a bedpan, you're changing sheets, you're you're you know talking to family and explaining diagnoses to family. You're dealing with a doctor calling in orders at the same time. I mean, it, you know, and you know, we if you spend any amount of time on a hospital ward, you know how absolutely you know challenging and stretched you know, our, our nurses are, and who, who pauses to actually express gratitude, appreciation. Um, I can count on, you know, a, a single hand, um, the number of times somebody, you know, a patient or a family member has really kind of expressed very strong appreciation for me um, as, as a clinician. And I can, you know, frankly, I'm embarrassed and, you know, as we talk about this right now that I haven't, you know, paused to really appreciate, you know, the, the, the whole ecosystem of people as much as we need to. Um, and the truth is, is that we just need more appreciation, more gratitude um, for the people who are doing this hard work. Because um, we treat, you know, they treat it like it's just their job. So then we treat it like it's just their job. Mm. And the truth is, is we, we ignore the fact that, you know, people working 12, 18, 24 hour shifts to take care of patients really are doing very heroic things, putting themselves um, in many times in, in, in harm way, harm's way. It's not immediate harm. But, you know, the effects of kind of cortisol, uh, you know, surges of cortisol, you know, when you're working irregular hours, um, takes a huge toll on people's bodies, their psyches, their families. Um, and I think our job as healthcare leaders, um, as people working alongside you know, professionals, is to express heavy doses of appreciation, you know, early and often, um, you know, at the same time that we're, we have an authentic culture of feedback. And I think that that tension is just so hard for people to navigate that many people just stop trying to navigate it. Mm, I suppose when, yeah, patients are scared, aren't they? Sometimes they, they don't, you know, don't behave in the, in the normal way that they would do in, in normal society because they're just scared they don't know. Um, yep. But we need to remember that, you know, those nurses are, and doctors and physicians are doing that great job to look after us all. Yeah, and I, and I don't actually think that the appreciation needs to come from the patients and the family members. I think the appreciation needs to come from each other. And I think that's your whole point about kind of, you know, people taking care of people. Um, I think, you know, uh, a single compliment in a week can make someone feel, you know, better about their job, better about themselves. Um, never underestimate the power of a compliment, right? Um, and so I think we... Um, we as a, as, as healthcare professionals need to remind ourselves of that very frequently. And, and in regards to nursing, sort of looking forward to the next five, 10 years, easy, to, easy to say, I'm sure, but you know, have you got any thoughts about where nursing is looking, what nurses are going to look like in the next sort of five to 10 years in the healthcare industry? Yeah. So I think, um, uh, I, I, so I think there's several things that we have to kind of look at. I think one is we have to drive towards greater gender parity in the nursing profession. Um, I think, you know, nursing has historically been a feminized profession and i think we will all benefit when we start to see nursing as a profession that men and women can do together i think that's going to be really really important um and i you know we see uh, that happening but i think we need to see that happen uh, even more um and i think the second thing that i'm i'm i think very interested in seeing uh happen is a greater and more deliberate conversation around how the nursing profession interfaces with all the other professions. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the reality is, is that, you know, whether it's nursing or dentistry or pharmacy, I think got short shrift by medical schools. And so they ended up developing their own identities, which oftentimes translates into a conflictual relationship um, between the professions. I think we just have to do away from, do away with that. I mean, we have to get to a place where 
there is mutual appreciation, mutual understanding of the differences in professional training, the differences in professional competencies, and the valuable role each of these entities play. And I think to get there, we're going to have to change how we educate people. And it's going to be a 20 year project, not a five or 10 year project, because you're going to have to kind of put to rest a generation of, of physicians that trained in, in silos um, and, and nurses who trained in silos and, and pharmacists who trained in silos and start to think about how do you, how do you bring all of these things together? And then, you know, number three, I think we just have to make this a better job. And I don't mean we have to pay people more. Um, we have to make these doable jobs. And um, I, what I'll, what I'll, you know, I, you know, I'm going to go on a stretch and say there's been a blue collarization of the healthcare healthcare professions. Um, you know, it's about the shifts. It's about the number of days you're willing to work. It's about the number of hours you're willing to work. Um, and we've stopped talking about what I think really matters, which is professional excellence. Um, and you know, I remember a time, you know, early in my childhood where you know it wasn't about you know like finding a doctor but it was about finding the best doctor it wasn't about finding a nurse but it was about finding the best nurse um and i think what's what's happened is is you know because we've we've brought so much operational operations management into you know large scale healthcare delivery is that we've we've kind of in many ways sucked the soul out of the delivery of of healthcare um and it's you know, when we hire doctors, uh, uh, you know, when I started at Caremore and we were hiring doctors, the number one question that was asked in, in an interview was, are you willing to work, you know, Q4 weekends or whatever it was? Um, and, you know, the, the questions weren't around, are you somebody who is passionate, compassionate, willing to go the extra mile for the patients? Mm. So we have to reset, I think, what we value. Um, and so I'm really hoping that you know, we get away from this kind of shift worker mentality that I, I that I think exists, um, and that I think you know strongly exists within within all of the, the the healing professions right now, and go back to a place where we see ourselves as professionals. And I think to do that, we have to get away from paying people hourly <laughs> to paying them a salary. Um, I think we have to get away from uh, you know uh, you know measuring widgets. Um, and you know, did you you know did you do X, Y, and Z to actually valuing the things that are more difficult to actually measure? Mm. Um, you know, it was you know Saint Exupery and the Little Prince who said you know that that which is uh, uh, essential is invisible to the eye, and I think that's the exact same thing um, when you think about quality in healthcare. Just because you can measure it doesn't mean that it is the best measure or metric for quality. Um, the most important things are the things you actually can't measure. Did the, did, did the nurse or doctor, you know, put their hand on the patient and express true, genuine compassion or empathy for the patient when they were delivering a terrible diagnosis? Mm. Um, you know, did they stay the extra couple of hours that they needed to stay to do the work, to take care of, you know, what needed to be done for the patient or their family? And, you know, I think um, I can speak about the U.S. You know, there has unfortunately been this invasion of, um, you know, what I really think of as a shift worker mindset in healthcare, where it's clock in, clock out. Um, and, you know, there, there's a different time in, in that we can go back to, to some extent, um, which is, you know, I'm here to do the job that needs to be done. And that's what professionals do. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think the, um, the thing that you say you can't measure is sometimes is that softer skills of working with a family, working, making sure the patient feels at ease when they're at the most vulnerable. You know, you can't measure that, but that's always, you know, that's the, the biggest thing people talk about was the feeling you of their care measure, sometimes rather than their, their solution necessarily. You can't measure it, but you can still extract extract it. So, you know, earlier today, you know, I just sent an email to all of our 2000 employees and I said, send me one sentence about an unsung hero in this organization. Just one sentence. And I, you know, it's been, it's been the greatest thing ever. I mean, I just got, you know, 200 some odd emails in the course of a morning. Um, and I've, I've got 200 stories of small acts of heroism that, you know, people all across the organization, clinical people, non-clinical people are doing. And I can tell you something, those emails are probably more accurate assessments of who the superstars are in this organization than, you know, the quarterly incentive payment and the measurements that we did, you know, to arrive at the calculation for the quarterly incentive payments. Mm. Um, and so again, 
it's harder to do this. You know, you got to spend the time to solicit the feedback, but the information, the data that you're getting is measurable. It's valuable. And I, you know, there's, there's, there's nurses in our organization. There's a woman, you know, nurse named Ronique Tatum, who, you know, is works in our touch program, which is our home, home visiting nurse program here at Caremore. Um, she, you know, I got three emails about Ronique Tatum this morning. Um, there's signal in that. I, I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that Ronique is one of our real superstars at Caremore. Um, nice. You know, she's a great nurse. And I know that because people took the time to send a sentence to say, you know, she's one of the true superstars at, at this organization. So I think, again, I think it goes back to more appreciation, more gratitude, um, you know, valuing the things that are more difficult to measure. Um, but I, but I would argue you can still get signal for it, even if you can't actually measure it. Um, those are the things that are going to make being nurses and doctors really exciting again. And what, um, what are the sort of, you know, two, three things that maybe you've learned from nurses over your career? Oh, uh, where do I start? I mean, I, I would say, you know, number one, um, it, it's actually the value of, of really spending time with the patient. Um, I would say that is, you know, I think that's a luxury, um, just the way staffing is done in U.S. hospitals that nurses are really afforded. And, you know, we, as doctors, we tend to think of ourselves as a captain of the ship and, you know, it's the nurses who are really the captain of the ship and it's because they're at the bedside all the time, right? I mean, that's, they're the ones who get to know the families. They're the ones who, who understand the subtle dynamics that actually drive, you know, care. We talked about social determinants of health. The, the nurses on the wards are usually the ones who actually know way more about the social and family context that our patients live in because they're thinking about discharge, because they're meeting all the different players, you know, not for short five minute, you know, discussions about the condition, but they're, they're there. Um, and that I think is, is uh, just invaluable. So I think it starts there. I think number two, it, you know, I think there is the humility around just recognizing the experience of nurses. Um, they, you know, have seen you know, a lot of medicine as pattern recognition. And, you know, if you're an experienced nurse, you have seen a lot of patterns. Um, and so I think, you know, recognizing and that the value of the nurse as part of an extended healthcare team and decision making and recognizing, I think, patterns um, is, you know, absolutely essential. And then, you know, I would say the, the third thing um, that I've really appreciated about all the nurses and I, that I've worked with and, and I've really learned is just how valuable they are in actually taking care of the broader healthcare workforce. They're not just taking care of the patients, but they're often taking care of everyone, you know, within that within that um, clinical environment. They're taking care of the medical assistants. They're taking care of the doctors. Um, you know, the healing that they bring doesn't just stop at the patient's bedside. I think it, it comes to the whole clinical environment. And so I think, you know, again, that's sort of one of those undervalued aspects uh, that I think those of us who are in positions of leadership have an obligation to bold, magnify, underline, and extract um, and reward because there is just so much value in that. You talk about burnout. Um, one of our best lines of defense for burnout is probably, you know, the nurses who, you know, work uh, on, on the wards um, or in clinics with, with our patients and with, our, with, with other clinicians. And so, again, I think we have to start thinking differently about how all the pieces fit together and, and what everyone does to kind of do their part for, for, for patients. Super. So Joe, I know you're very busy and I thank you so much for the time today. Um, just sort of finishing up now, really, what, what would be your message that you'd like to share with our nurses and, and our physicians? Yeah, I mean, I would just say, um, be part of the change. Uh, I know that this profession is right now in a period of crisis. I know it's, uh, it's in a period of transition and transformation. Um, I think there's two things you can do. You can either be a, an object of those changes uh, or you can be someone who's driving those changes and making sure that um, that they're that they're done sensibly, you know, with all of the kinds of things that you care about in mind. And the one thing I'll say to those folks who then transition into those positions is to never leave the bedside and never leave, um, you know, the clinic. Um, you know, I'm I've got a job that has a lot of different components to it, but truly the favorite. Thing that I do here is I still see patients, um, not as often as I should, not as often 
as I really would like to. Um, but that afternoon, you know, a month or, or, or afternoon every other week, um, you know, how, whatever it ends up being, um, where I am, you know, seeing patients, working as, alongside healthcare professionals, you know, makes makes sure that I'm I'm still connected to what's actually happening. Um, you know, one of the big embarrassments of my time, you know, working in federal policy making was when I started thinking like a bureaucrat and stopped thinking like a doctor. And I think one of the most important things we, we do is, we, you know, one of the most important obligations of having earned, you know, your credentials as a nurse or a doctor is that you never lose that kind of nurse or doctor sensibility. Um, and the world needs more of it. And so um, I think we just, we just have to kind of embolden that professionalism and, and hold on to it as long as we can. Super. Dr. Sachin, thank you so much for your time today. Um, thank you for watching The Voice of Nursing. Thank you to all our nurses and physicians and medical assistants for looking after us all. Uh, we'll catch up with you again soon. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Cheers.